preliminary questions before we start about the handout you know flip it over you can see our track record on the back and there's a order form there so this morning no it was noon noon time I did a little bullpen session a short one about um, you know our initial annual forecast which was for uh, th that the Dow could you know hit 29,000 possibly based upon bull market um, average bull market moves using the February 11th 2016 bull market low um, which was a Ned Davis research to find bear market bottom there it was down 13 over 13 percent over 145 calendar days peak the trough but um, we also had a positive January indicator trifecta January barometer was up the first five days was was up and Santa Claus rally was up also um, pretty bullish implications for the all years and also for years as a whole years uh, for all years and also for midterm election years specifically um, only four times since 1950 uh, excuse me five times was the trifecta positive in a midterm year so not necessarily a statistically significant number but kind of interesting that it doesn't happen a lot in the midterm year so with that overall bullish um, you know outlook for you know what the market was showing us we do have some seasonal weakness here and we do have some four-year cycle weakness and that's what we're gonna look at today what to do in the worst six months and the, the you know the history of that and and what we do there so should you sell in midterm election year may um, probably some things probably not everything we don't like to go away we like to hold on to our winners and that sort of stuff but we'll get into that so just a um, brief word from our lawyers or whatever compliance uh, this is for informational purposes only past performance is not a guarantee of future results this is not an offer to buy or sell any securities consult with your advisors do your own due diligence use your head common sense etc so forth so um, the stock traders almanac is now in its fifth how you doing <laughs> there he is what's up rich um one of our uh st stellar star subscribers coming up front here um we've all been standing on the shoulders of of a giant my father yell hirsch for for um, five decades now that's why the 50th anniversary edition which was the 2017 i dedicated to him um and i put this quote from isaac newton on there to just sort of remind us all that everyone out there using all these seasonal cyclical patterns really owe a lot to, to Yale and him bringing all these things to the forefront and putting all these patterns on the Wall Street map and creating this handy iconic reference manual the stock printers almanac um, these talks I give are basically you know how to use this book um, along with some history about it so um, Yale, just so you know, uh, 94 and a half, living with mom in a nursing home, a little bit of dementia, but uh, still stomping around and, and uh, you know, pretty pretty set and they're in a good place. So I know people like to ask me, is your father still around kind of thing? So he is. Um, just a little look at some of the things we've done on the street. The uh, 1968 Almanac was the first one. Uh, I am as old as the Almanac. He started the company in 66 when I was born. So I've been born, bred, weaned, raised on seasonal patterns, cycles, and, and trends. Um, <laughs> you laugh. Uh, the 2018 book, which I shall use out, my Almanac Investor uh, book, which is was from 06, still in print with Wiley. Don't sell stocks on Monday. A great title was one of the uh, Yale's, um, uh, you know, phrases that he came up with for. The, the the weekly patterns, the daily trading patterns, you know, what the stocks do on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, etc. cetera. Um, this 86 book, my super boom book, which we're not going to get into the long-term forecast here. We don't have time for everything. But back in 2010, right, when the Dow was at about 10,000, I put out a forecast based upon some long-term historical patterns of 500% uh, moves following war and inflation for the Dow to go to 38,820 which is six times the intraday low on March 6, 2009. People thought it was a little bit um, crazy back then, but lo and behold, you look at it, it made a, it mathematically made sense. It was only about a 5% return from the high, of, uh, from the close of 99. And here we are up at, you know, 25,000-ish. Um, it's not looking so crazy now. So that's to occur by the year 2025. And um, that's what that book's about. And we also have updates in the newsletter. 
the little book of stock market cycles available out there and then you know some of the places we are proud to be able to uh, appear or they quote us or doing a bit on cnbc with um brian sullivan's new crack of dawn even pre-dawn worldwide exchange at 5 a.m eastern it's good i like brian so um it's it's a good show to do but that, that's always fun and then just a little uh trip down memory lane reminds you some of the places we've been yale on wall street week um uh, back in the late 70s, might have been early 80s, with the nice 70s mustache still cooking there. Uh, Dow 3420 was the forecast Yale made in 1976 for the last 500% move based upon that same super boom pattern. And I have, still have a box of these t-shirts that he gave out at some seminar he gave back then. Picture of me and dad from, I think it's 15 years ago, 03. You can see my hairline now getting closer to my father's. That was at our old office in Ulta Pan. So just a reminder, I've handed you all these flyers. Um, it's a digital subscri newsletter subscription. It comes with a free copy of the annual almanac every year, 150 for one year. Two years is 250. It's a great deal. Uh, weekly research, analysis, signals, and alerts it gets emailed to you. We recommend stocks and ETFs, and I'll tell you about the performance of some of that stuff later. So that's what we have here today, and then we'll get into what we came here to really talk about. Our philosophy, uh, as many of you know, based on history, uh, a little take on the Santiana quote that those who fail to remember the past are condemned to repeat it. We think that those who profit, those who study market history are bound to profit from it. You'll see I'll write in the books when I sign it, Profit from History. But as my buddy Stan Stolwell says, use history as a guide, not as gospel. Um, or Mark Twain has a quote about it rhyming. Uh, we look for setups with history, not just it's May 1st, you sell. No, you look at how the pattern is, is playing out this year and look for some technical indicators to confirm that. So for the past 50 years plus, we've been um, researching, analyzing, and testing uh, practically every stock market trend imaginable. We publish the findings in the Stock Traders Almanac annually, the newsletter weekly, monthly. We update it. So you'll see what we do for the May Almanac, give you an idea of what's to expect in a midterm election year May with different things going on at different days of the month as well as the overall monthly performance. Um, so that's updated weekly and monthly. We can use that information to help us construct portfolios using the cycles, the seasonals, recurring patterns, as well as current trends in the economy, monetary and government policy. Um, again, being proponents of the four-year political cycle, you have to pay attention to what's going on, uh, especially in Washington because it's as we say in the beginning of the book, what happens in Washington affects what happens on Wall Street, like the moon affects the tides on the earth. Market internals, um, you'll see not so great right now. You know, uh, market breath has it's been proved the, the last week or so, but um, it had lo been looking kind of weak uh, at the end of, of April. Um, again, new lows are a little bit higher than we like. Sentiment, kind of middling, not really giving us much of an indication with the put call ratios or the surveys like the um, investors intelligence or AAII and then we get into old school fundamentals and technicals when we pick our stocks. The major cycles, war, peace, and secular bull and bear markets, that's the super boom cycle forecast, the four year presidential election cycle, the midterm year we were talking about that before we got started. What creates that is this regular election every four years and the midterms. And the seasonal cycles are bread and butter, the best six months switching strategy, not just selling May and go away. You got to buy in October and get yourself sober. Some of you have heard me say that before, especially here in Vegas or in November for the Traders Expo. Then quarterly, monthly, weekly, daily, and intraday patterns. I'll look at some of the quarterly stuff and we'll do a little bit on May, but I'm not going to get too deep into all the intraday or, or daily stuff, but it is in the almanac. And I think intraday is um, impressively consistent despite all of the algos and computer driven trading and that stuff you'll see some of the same peaks and valleys throughout the day that have been going on for years and of course the january indicators which i mentioned at the beginning um that was something i spoke about earlier today we're going to get into the best and worst six months a little bit more here so our forecast for 2018 um usually break it out these days in you know worst case base case best case um worst case we give it a very small chance this year some sort of nuclear event with North Korea or no positive impact from tax reform or some other doomsday scenario. That doesn't seem to be happening. Even though there was a little market scare today with uh, what's uh, Kim uh, saying he didn't want to 
speak with the South Korean guy because we're still doing war games or something. Um, base case scenario, above average midterm year returns in range of maybe 8 to 15% with a mild worst six months correction or a pullback. And that's what I think is upon us right now. We had <clears throat> almost all of that at 8% at the outset of the year. And then we gave it back with some volatility. I am concerned about the technicals right now. Um, there's really like, uh, um, you know, the, the jury's out here with the bulls and the bears. There's a, what is it? It's kind of like a wedge uh, forming right here with the, since the, the January tops. And um, and I was looking at Larry McMillan the other day, and there's a 2750 on the S&P, this level that's kind of got to get through for the bulls to really get confident. And then there's some... Um, I guess it's pretty much the February low has got to get breached uh, or the 200-day moving average before we um, really have a decision on whether the bulls or bears are going to take over here. But we're, we're taking some defensive positions and getting a little more cautious. Best case scenario, no, uh, unicorns and rainbows. Um, everything pans out. Tax reform reduces earnings. You know, paychecks grow. We get... Um, bonuses and everything we get an infrastructure bill god i would love to see that the roads in my area are so horrible um and the grid but uh this is where we came up with that dow twenty nine thousand possibility based off the average um bull market gain of 85.6 percent going back to 1900 um off of the february 11th uh 2016 low um so let's look a little bit deeper at this year here is the annual excuse me, seasonal pattern for the um, uh, stock market. You have the four-year cycle broken out here, excuse me, with the green line being the pre-election year. You can see how strong it is. There was only one losing pre-election year uh, for the Dow since 1939. That was 2015. Um, black is the post-election year. Blue is the election year, and red is the midterm year. You can see you can see I've highlighted right there. It's pretty clear. I don't think I need to point that out. And you can get my slides if you want to. Feel free to take pictures, but if you want the whole deck, just send us an email. If you want my card, I can give you that too. So you can see the, the more pronounced pullback in the midterm election year were six months. And this is where we're sitting right now in the, or, or in, at, the, at the outset of the worst two quarters of the four-year cycle. You can see the pink line or purple, whatever, however that looks to you. Um, started out really like gangbusters above, almost like a midterm election year. Came back down through everything. And of course, it's going to be more volatility in one year than the smoothing of all the years averaged out. But we're kind of tracking along with that midterm election year pattern. We've come up a little bit positive, but we ended up being up about 2 or 2% or so um, as of the day before today, before the market came down a couple hundred points. So we're looking at this pronounced... We're six months in the midterm year, and we've already been taking precautions. So here it is in a tabular uh, expression. The little orange blocks highlight the worst two quarters. This is you know this where, where we get that sweet spot of the midterm election of the four-year cycle, what we call a bottom picker's paradise. Again, one of Yale's songwriter uh, turnings of phrases. And um, then in the black boxes with the white numbers, we have the best three-quarter combination. Uh, the sweet spot of the four-year cycle, the fourth quarter of the midterm year into the um, second quarter, Q1 and Q2 of the pre-election year. You can see the Dow's up about 20% and um, S&P 21 and the uh, NASDAQ about 32%. But just go back for a second here. Whoops. You can see that, see the red line spike in October, that big fourth quarter move. That's what we're looking for, and that's how I think we can get back up to that maybe 8 to 15% range if we get a nice little run, especially maybe uh, they don't lose so many seats in the midterm election this year and sort of um, surprise people. So there's the, uh, the, the quarterly um, pattern there. And then what we have is the um, tendency for a nearly 50% gain uh, off the midterm low to the pre-election year high. For NASDAQ, which only goes back to 71, it's about 70% from the midterm low. We could have had the midterm low already in February. That, that could be it. We don't know. I don't. I think we're going to go a little bit lower. I think we have a potential for a Ned Davis research bear, you know, somewhere in that 13 to 1999%. Um, we'll see what happens over the summer. We'll see what happens with the midterm election campaigning and with Iran and North Korea and tariffs and, you know, all that stuff coming out of Washington right now. But 
I've highlighted on the left side, interestingly to me, uh, all of the lows that occur, there's a cluster of lows in January, and then a lot of lows in um, October. And I think it's, what, nine out of the last 17 bear markets have bottomed in the midterm year, and a lot of them get turned in October. So that's when we're going to start looking for that sweet spot of the four-year cycle. And you can see the other part that I find amazing is that the pre-election year, which is next year, 2019, um, those highs, the bulk of those highs, all occur in December. That's what the green boxes are. And a lot of them, if you look closely, at the last trading day of the year. So just sort of drilling down a little bit into where we are now, um, here's our mark at a glance. This is what comes with the newsletter subscription monthly. Um, we find people kind of dig this. It's a nice, concise um, rundown of analysis. Uh, my partner, Christopher Mistel, who some of you may have spoken to, he does a lot of it this year. He was out this month, so I was tasked with trying to emulate his, his uh, technique. And I think I did a pretty good job. I used a very hip word for psychological up there. Woke, anyone know what that means? It's, it's, <laughs> it means it's become aware a little bit, but it, it relates to popular culture a little bit. Um, but basically, the accessible sediment came down. We're sort of not seeing any real uh, extremes on the sediment front. Fundamental, um, things are pretty firm there, uh, maybe a little bit softer GDP, but um, basically, um, you know, we're looking at continuing in that 2% growth area. Uh, um, we'll see what happens with all of the trade talks with China and, and, and the other things um, that are going on on the geopolitical front. Technically, um, you know, we were bouncing for a bit when I put this out, but today's sell-off has a puts a little bit of fear in there. And, um, you know, that 200-day moving average I mentioned before is kind of that line in the sand, and everyone's looking at it, so it probably really is. Um, doesn't mean it's exact. You know, draw that 200-day draw that moving average with a crayon or a magic marker, not a fine point pencil because it might come through that a bit and then come back above it. Um, so we have our sell signal. We're looking for um, you know, potential for some uh, weakness here in the worst six months. Monetary policy, pretty solid. I mean, I've been sort of Im impressed with Powell. I think he's pretty solid. He's not spooking the market. He's uh, got some market savvy, uh, some experience himself. Um, he does what he says he's going to do, and he doesn't talk too much about things, a little more closer to the vest than, than uh, Janet Yellen and, and Bernanke were. Um, but we're looking for, uh, you know, um, potential uh, uh, pressure from monetary policy, creating a little bit of a sell-off here, especially with the bonds, um, you know, having to be, be issued to create, uh, to finance all this debt that we're losing and, and all the spending that we're going to be doing um, with the tax cut. Seasonally, we're bearish. We know that. Sell in May. We're six months. So um, subsequent to this outlook, we did put out our, our, our sell signal, um, and now we have begun to move things out. That's for not for NASDAQ, not the best eight months, which uh, this gentleman up here uses pretty successfully. He'll see his name on the screen momentarily. So then looking at the pulse of the market, this is, again, something that comes right out of the Stock Traders Almanac. In the back of the book, I don't know if any of you grab one, you can look. Uh, towards the end, there's these weekly... Um, indicator records. This is something that Yale put in here way back in the old days so people can keep track of things. So we've turned it into something in the newsletter, you know, Excel spreadsheet, where you have the weekly performance of the Dow, um, the week change, the, the S&P and the <coughs> NASDAQ as well. And then we put some focus on, I mentioned intraday or daily patterns, we put some focus on Friday and Monday. You know, there's a lot of um, covering up positions when when coming into the weekend. So it's Friday is not really Friday only. It's the last trading day of the week. Could be a Thursday, depending upon different holidays. And again, Monday also, when there's a Monday holiday here, it's the first trading of the week. It's a Tuesday. We see that down Friday, down Monday. It's a warning sign that whatever people were, were worried about over the weekend, they weren't relieved by anything they, they saw over the weekend, so they sell more on, on Monday as well. Um, I was talking about breath not being, uh, and internals not being super strong right now. You can see the down by the uh, bullet at the bottom, there's that number six. Yeah, we got some, a few more uh, advancers and decliners, but not a great plural, plurality, excuse me. And then in the um, new highs and new lows, you know, about even, 200 roughly new lows is not a great sign. Um, not a lot of indication from the sentiment indicators right now. And again, treasuries and, and bond rates just inching up nice and slowly. Um, hopefully we'll get a little steepening of that curve if possible. The long end gets stronger. 
So a little look at the May Almanac. Um, Midterm rate, May is ranked pretty poorly. You can see negative numbers across the board with the five indices we track. Uh, Dow, S&P, NASDAQ on the two Russells. Um, not a whole lot of uh, uh, you know wins there on, on top of gains. I mean, the Dow's and S&P are, um, and NASDAQ are negative. Again, Russell 1000 uh, as well. Russell 2000 has got one more win, but there, there's a big, uh, bigger average loss. Then here's our monthly strategy calendar that we provide. Um, that you can also print down a PDF if you like it. You can see up at the very top, I know it's not super huge, it's the sector seasonalities that are in play, that are beginning or that are ending. Um, let's see if we can see that up there. You got gold short, gold and silver short, material short coming up. In play is consumer debt, consumer staples, natural gas, high tech, utilities, computer tech, and finishing up banking, healthcare, and materials real estate and transports. I don't know if you can see it up there. And then um, we have the happy bulls for days of the of the month that were up more than 60% of the time over the past 21-year um, uh, recent period of time. We like to compare recent time frames to older. I don't go shorter than 20, 21 years because 21 because we want to have an odd number so we don't get any 50-50 days. You know, we're, it's up half the time. We want a little bit of uh, uh, see where the bias is. And we compare since 1950 through since 71 when NASDAQ started and also since the 87 crash, which is an important moment where things change in the market. But this is the recent, you know, time frame. The bearish days are um, days when the market's been down 60% or more of the time. And we have a couple of the reminders about trading around options expiration, holidays, beginnings and ends of months, and then all the different economic releases that are coming out that we deem important for that month. So let's look at the sell in May pattern. I said something about 1988, so uh, starting comparing things from there. So we take um, the one year seasonal pattern since 1950 in the black line, compare it to that same time frame, uh, uh, the same period since 1987 or starting in 88. So we can see what's happening currently versus what happened a long time ago. And then just to um, deal with the detractors, uh, we have in the red line, the one-year seasonal pattern since 1901, from 1901 through 1949. And what this shows us here, I don't know if I can, my mouse doesn't appear up on there. What this shows us here, you see it's sort of a buy in May period. This was when we had a economy that was driven by agriculture, where uh, about what 20 some odd percent of the, of the country was in the farming business. When you come into the spring with the reaping and, and uh, excuse me, with the sowing and the planting and the fertilizer and the hiring and the fuel and the equipment, you're pump a lot of money into the economy. That changed with the military industrial complex and after World War II and the service economy. So you can see this flat period prone to more corrections from May to October. And that's the basis for the best and worst six months, not just sell in May and definitely not go away. So here's our um, black box system. It's the only one that was proven uh, using evidence-based analysis. Anyone read the book, uh, Evidence-Based Technical Analysis by uh, David Aronson back in 08 came out, it was our best investment book of the year. Um, he, he compared 6,200 of memory serves, different black box systems, you know, algorithmic trading systems, and found using the scientific method, uh, which is called uh, disproving the null hypothesis Anybody know what that means? Took me a while to, comp to comprehend that. It's basically assuming that the results that you get are the result of chance and have no predictive power, and then you have to prove that wrong. So all of the 6,200 that they analyzed with his colleague, Tim Masters at Baruch College, which is a big technical analysis, uh, they have a, a good CMT program there. Um, none of them had predictive power, all the result of chance. We asked them to do the same thing with the best and si worst six months. And they started in 1987, which was the year after <clears throat> we published it first in the Almanac to see what happened, you know, so it wasn't back testing, it was forward testing when we came out with it. The only one to disprove the null hypothesis, to not be the result of chance, and to prove to have predictive power. So, average gains for that 7.1%. Um, uh, for the Dow in the best months, November to April, the worst months, a, a minor loss of 0.02%. Take a $10,000 average investment, one time investment in 1950, you gain 843000 in the best months, you lose <clears throat> 100 bucks and change. Now, adding in some technical analysis, 
use MACD. You guys all know what MACD is? MACD? A little bit. Moving averages. So it's three exponential moving averages. An exponential moving average is a moving average that weights the most current data point greater than the early or the first data point. So you have the difference between two moving, exponential moving averages and then the exponential moving average of that, of that difference. And you've seen it, you'll see it on the next chart how they cross over and show us a change in momentum. So adding that technical indicator, trigger, starting after October 1st for a buy and April 1st for a sell, increases the gain to 8.9% average and expands the loss to 1.6, but it really, the power of compounding shows up there where it basically triples those returns. You gain about two and a half million dollars with that same $10,000 investment in the best six months versus a loss of about 7,000 in the worst six months. Doesn't work every year. This year wasn't great, and you're going to see that here. But over the long haul, um, it it pans out, and um, it's a great way to analyze the market and look at it. So here's our sell signal. Excuse me, our sell signal. Not a great sell signal. Not a picture perfect one, but you can see the um, little orange bar. The histogram goes negative. You can't really see the lines crossing over um, at the bottom because it's a little too close. But yeah, sold a, rallied a little bit after our sell signal. Great time to selling the strength which we did and um excuse me and now we have a little weakness here but as i was saying we're, we're you know we got to break out above that 2700 actually we, we sort of stalled that resistance that red line up there is pivot point resistance we're bouncing off the 200 day we're sort of pinching in that wedge it's going to break out one way or another i'm concerned that we're going to go a little bit lower over the next several months so what's our strategy it's not sell in may it's not go away it's sell your losers let your winners ride the key to investing is getting out of your losers fast and admitting you're wrong and not hanging on to them and letting your winners ride. a couple of strategies we have for taking profits on winning stock positions especially is sell half on a double especially for a small cap or a tiny stock where you want to take your initial investment off the table let your winnings ride um and then another way we look at it is something's up 40 percent you sell 20 percent up another 40%, you sell another 20%, et cetera, and you end up taking some profits and, and uh, capturing the majority of the gain. Um, so we do sell some things, but we don't go away. We you know, go long stocks around September, October. We go short stocks somewhere around June, July, once we get a little bit closer to the summer. And um, we do trade some different ETFs with the indices. MACD I told you about. There's some other technical tools that you can use, advanced decline lines. But it's basically a risk-off move, a shift from aggressive uh, to more defensive. We tighten up stops, limit new long purchases. As I said, get rid of some losing or underperforming positions. Take a little protection. We've got a few bond ETF recommendations. You can do other things that you like. I own the TLT and the AGG now, the the twenty-year um, long-term Treasury, and then the AGG is that um, Barclays iShares Barclays Total Core Bond. So it's a little bit of a um, yield that you can get where you park, you park your cash right now while, while interest rates are so low. Um, so here's our friend in the front row, Richard Canfield, who successfully uses the strategy for the um, uh, best eight months with NASDAQ. Richard called me up to subscribe, resubscribe, and said he did very well. He took a million and a half dollars out of his um, IRA and put it into the QQQs at our buy signal in 2015. Sold out for 11% gain. Our sell signal in June 2016, um, excuse me, 2014 and 2015. Then in 2017, again, another nice move for him there, up 17%. So it's a very simple uh, strategy to use, uh, especially in an IRA. Um, but it's also, you know, a different bias to your thinking. You know, if something happens where you come into some money here, whether it's a 401k rollover or a grant, you know, an ant leaves you something, there's no need to rush in right now and dump it on the market. You can set it up, wait for that fatter pitch, that bottom picking paradise area, especially in a midterm year, to get in. So it's not necessarily you have to move. You know, you can park some some money in cash. Cash is a position, and it does give you time to think. So let's look at some of the other seasonal patterns that we work with. Um, you can see this is the page right out of the almanac. This is page 92, if memory serves. I've highlighted in gray this sort of bullish cluster of sectors in October. It runs the gamut. You can see, and this is stock sectors. This is not any of the commodity stuff we were talking about a little bit earlier before we started. Um, you can see we've got a few shorts 
in the you know May area, computers, gold, silver, materials, which I'll show you about. We've got three time frames that we look at, 15-year, 10-year, 5-year, to look at what the recent performance has been and what <coughs> excuse me, performance has been a little longer. And, um, of course, the long oil trade at the bottom in December. So let's take the materials um, trade, for example, because it's pretty pronounced. <coughs> and very similar to the best and worst six months for the market, but you can see from May through October, it's pretty weak. Um, October through uh, um, May, pretty strong with a little very similar to S&P January break dip that we see. <coughs> and looking at that in a um, sort of format like, like to compare what I did for the, the best six months, except instead of being long the best months and, uh, and long the, the worst months, you're sector rotating, so you're switching. You're um, long the best and short the worst versus buy and hold. And you can see it's 15% doing that since 1990 uh, versus 5.3 buy and hold. That same $10,000 example grows to 377000 versus versus almost 40000 for just buying and holding. So the benefit of shorting the worst months and, and going long the best months. So we, we had our sell signal, as I mentioned. Oh, you want to get that? All right, pose for the picture. I'll send you the slides too, you know. Um, so what we did when we got our sell signal, uh, we sold the diamonds and the spiders, uh, as I call them, the Dow and, and S&P uh, ETFs, got rid of consumer discretionary and financials, but we continue to hold technology and small cap related ETFs as NASDAQ's best eight months doesn't end until June, and the Russell 2000 small cap index also runs uh, a little bit longer, best eight months uh, through June as well. <coughs> so... Continuing to hold the healthcare XLV, I own that one as well. And as I sh said, the uh, TLT, which I just picked up the other day, or maybe that was yesterday, and the um, AGG, the iShares Core US Aggregate Bond, I think it's about a 3% yield or something on that. So it's a, something, you know, that'll hold you over while you're sitting there waiting for your next move. Um, there's also some uh, seasonal sector trades that do well. If you look over here, the utilities under here. So we just got rid of these. Sell, sell. You see that utilities do well in the fall in the in the summer because of all the air conditioning, pretty much. I think all the electricity generation for AC. Um, we've got a few shorts on the list. Um, <clears throat> the gold miners, the J dust, uh, short the materials, and of course the two bonds. So here's the current you know ETF sector portfolio, which is what we're looking at right now. And uh, all these trades have been sent out to subscribers with specific buy, limit, sell targets, and stop losses. So let me tell you a little bit about our stock selection process. This is where um, we get a lot of juice uh, to portfolios. We combine solid old school fundamental analysis with seasonality and technicals. So we're not buying long stocks any time of the year really. Um, unless the market comes down quite a bit. We're mostly looking for getting into long portfolios in you know, August, September, October, and then going on the short side in the summer, um, looking you know, at uh, sort of July. We still, have, still seem to have some strength in July. We start looking at shorts there. But we use a Zach's Research Wizard <clears throat> as our fundamental screen database. Um, I did a class, master class, a few years back where I showed people the screen and the sort and it's, it's pretty cumbersome. I don't have any macros built in. I like to take all the data, sort it, take the stuff out that we don't want, and then sort it again. So we're looking at each step of the way. We're not missing something. So we take the database, about 8,000 stocks, and sort them by um, price to earnings ratio, price to sales ratio, and then revenue growth and acceleration, earnings growth and acceleration. And we look for, you know, comparable to whether it be the S&P or something like that. So it's not just in a vacuum. We're looking at those valuations and those levels compared to the overall market. So we also look at margins and debts and ratings and, and uh, insider holdings. And one of the things, so we get two stocks, great valuations, low PEs, great price to sales ratios, revenues are growing nicely, accelerating earnings, et cetera, so forth. And one stock is followed by 20 analysts, and the other stock is followed by, I don't know, three, four, five analysts. We're going to go for the one that is followed by less people because we're getting getting in there before 
<clears throat> this performance, this valuation has been realized by the wirehouses and all the big analysts on the street. A couple of recent, you know, successful examples. Um, anybody invest in the cannabis stocks? Cronus. Cronus. I don't know them. Um, I think it's something that you can make money with. I, I equate it like uh, to the Vancouver mining stock type thing. Um, I don't look at that kind of stuff anymore. But we we found one cannabis stock, unbeknownst to ourselves, Scott's Miracle Grow. <laughs> I own the stock. It's com yeah, and it's it's not just hydroponics. It's equipment and all the stuff. And what happened was in 2015. Um, let me see. I got the list up here. You can see. Uh, I think I think it got stopped out of the portfolio. I held it in my account, but um, I think it was back in 2015. It, it came up with great numbers, and then you know about six months later, the the quarterly you know uh, phone calls are talking about all the stuff they're selling to the cannabis industry. So um, we still have uh, um, stocks uh, from 2014, letting our winter ride, uh, United Health. The two copper trades, see Southern Copper and Global Brass and Copper Holdings, that's a copper seasonality trade. We usually get a low in um, uh, December for copper prices, and we found these two stocks correlate quite well. Um, we've got a few other stocks from 2016 picks on there, some from 2017. Um, market was moving away from us a little bit in 2017, so we, we ended up having to up some buy limits on, uh, on the ones um, in December. and hindsight 2020 if we had just took taken that basket we came up with in October and bought it at the market we'd have been better but um, prudence being necessary we did use buy limits and didn't, didn't get them all so this particular methodology has produced um, some pretty stellar results uh, since we started this portfolio in 20, uh, 2001 and on the back of that flyer I give you you can see the same graph with the order form there um, in case you want to be ready to get these picks when we put them out again and, and get our analysis. So since 2001, this whole methodology has outpaced, and this is full year through 2017. Um, you can see the updated number on the website if you log in uh, and look at the, or, or take a free trial, you know, seven day free trial. So nearly 460% versus about 200 for the Russell 2000, which we kind of, equate our style of stock picking. Those are more of the stocks that we're looking for than S&Ps, and then versus 118 for the S&P. So pretty solid, um, takes a little time and, and some patience and you know some little long-term outlook, but I think we provide a um, pretty stellar service for people at, at a pretty good price. And um, I'm gonna show you that price again and wrap it up and then open the floor to questions. So, if nobody got it, if you didn't get a flyer, there's one here. If anybody wants to take out a subscription, you can fill it out or give me a card and put your credit card number on there, or I'll take a picture of your credit card number, or whatever it is. And uh, I also got a few books, and you get a, I'll, I'll give you your free autographed 2018 almanac now if you want it, or if somebody wants one, um, we'll sell them for 25 bucks here just, just for the show. So that's it. Thank you, everyone, and. Um, Please throw up your questions. Put your hand up and we'll, we'll have a chat. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, it sounds like you're, you're saying the volatility is going to continue, right? I, I think so. Um, not just necessarily volatility per se, but perhaps a reduction in trading volume, which tends to happen over the summer, uh, in addition to the general seasonal where people go out and play golf and the kids are home. We're going to have the distraction of the midterm election, and we've got some other this cycle specific distractions from some of our geopolitical activities but yeah i think we got some downside pressure here another question yeah. sir you mentioned a tlt and another bond do you worry about with rates going up the tlt is not going to it's a place to park cash during the worst six months it's not something we're going to hang on to and it's but yeah i mean it went down a percent today yeah it hit my buy limit i think it came in this morning Exactly. It's instead of having it in cash or in. Right. Let's see. There's there's pressure on the bonds. Yeah, they're going to have to put more bonds out to finance what the revenue we're not getting in from the tax cuts and to finance any infrastructure stuff. Let's see. What did I pay for the TLT? I paid one eighteen for it. It's down a percent. Uh, point one point two percent today. 
one seventeen twenty. But that's one day. Yeah, yeah. It's something we're holding for the worst six months. Um, yes, yes, ma'am. It's the twenty year. It's not. That's not short. That's kind of long term. Which one's TBT? I don't. That's shorter. That's a two, two to five year, or something like that. Or five. You're talking inverse ETF? No, no. It's long the bond. It's. It's a long position in the long bond. Did I get that? Anybody over here? You, it's a seasonal trade, ma'am. It's not. It's not a long-term hold for the for the bonds. But you can short the t, the the twenty-year bond if you want right now. Go ahead. I I don't think I don't think it's a horrible trade. I'm just saying, you know, parking some cash on the sideline. I think the S and P could probably go down a little bit more than the TLT right now. So, and then the other one I like even better is the AGG, which is total bond. It's got corporates in it too, so it's a higher interest rate. You have a question? No. I thought you. I thought you were back there. What other country has a stronger economy and a, you know, better outlook for you know? I think so. I mean, there'll be some fluctuations, but yeah. Say again. And it goes the other way too. You know, strong dollar will bring rates up too. Strong economy brings rates and dollars up. Um. Other questions from left field, right field, center field, anything I said or didn't say? <sighs> you know, it's the art of the deal. I mean, he's negotiating. It's a totally different type of person in that office. I mean, I try not to get political. Yeah, I like, I've been interviewed by Larry. Larry's a good guy, you know? Um, he's, and he knows how to convey things in the media as opposed to shock stuff, but, you know, I didn't vote for either of the main candidates this year. Um, I wrote in my rugby buddy who's a <laughs> district attorney and a lawyer. I think he got 787 votes, but I was, I was a protest vote for me. I wasn't happy with anything out there. Sir? With their earnings the way they are, I mean, how can we go into a bearish market? Their earnings have been killer. Um, let's go look at this chart. No, I mean this is not really a bullish market, right? I mean it's kind of on the fence of being bearish. This this chart. I mean earnings are great, but the market went up a whole lot in advance of all the earnings. So the earnings are even better than they were last. Year. I'm with it. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not long term bearish. This is just a short term seasonal trade. We've come a little bit too far. We've got midterm election year pressure. I'm not saying get out of the market forever. I'm saying be a little patient. Wait for a fatter pitch in the in the late summer fall. Mm -hmm. We know roughly what they're going to do, most of them, and I think the market knows that already, and it's by and large, it's priced in. It got way ahead. That's what happened in January. Yeah. yeah. A lot of that's probably, and I think, you know, you're going to see some mudslinging coming out of the midterm campaigning, and they're already doing it. He's he's already buddying up to the NRA, and the Democrats are running scared. They don't have much to put out there right now, but, you know, you live where I live in blue greater new york and it's a different vibe than than a lot of you know other parts of the country so you know um it's going to be a battle is the point and i think that takes people's attention away from the stock market and makes people a little jittery there's uncertainty which the market doesn't like so that's um that's what i think about that any other questions out there i've been looking on this side for now we're good all right so anybody want a subscription Subscription, come on up or catch me. I'll be around a little bit tomorrow. I'll be doing interviews for the video thing in the afternoon. And um, if somebody wants a book, I got one of those here too. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. This, this is. We're gonna send this to you later. This.